Mayor Christian Logic has come up with a plan to diffuse the debate on whether gay marriage should be legalized. Um, we are not always certain um, whether he's addressing states or um, the nation as a whole, uh, but at any rate, he he is um, has a plan to let go of the institution of marriage and move on to a new society um, where living in couples, cohabiting couples, might have the same value as marriage. Uh, my wife and I uh, would like to respond to this. Um, we see a few problems with this position. The biggest problem being that it would be resigning rather early in the contest for Christians at any rate. If Christians are to stand for the truth, even when it's inconvenient to do so, they have to consider what it means to be salt and light and preserve what is good in society and what is good about marriage. Now, one possibility for why MCL, mere Christian logic, holds to uh, this position um, that we may, we probably could just as well scrap or dissolve marriage, it has to do with the definition, an odd definition, that sex equals marriage. He holds to this position. Now, this is sometimes common among internet uh, Christians, but um, it's not technically a very sound position. Let's look at a couple of scriptures. In Exodus 22, we have an instance where a man is uh, seducing a virgin, and then the father of the virgin is given a choice as to whether the man needs to commit um, and marry his daughter or not. But just the mere fact of the seduction and the um, the uh, rape or sex it does not by itself entail marriage. It's never defined marriage and certainly not suggested in that passage. And if we consider this position, um, lots of irrational uh, uh, phenomena would result. Um, for example, rape and incest, uh, child molestation, would, does that entail marriage? Does that involve that? What about um, casual sex when um, clearly um, it's not a marriage commitment, a, a binding covenant binding between two parties is not involved. Um, someone is just letting their uh, horniness get the better of them. Um, so clearly um, that's not a position supported by scripture. Um, in addition, there are Greek words that distinguish um, porneia for sexual immorality, um, which would be something like um, what we've been talking about, and um, the term for marriage, uh, which is entirely uh, different. Um, so there clearly is a distinction in Scripture. Another um, obvious position which would subvert this um, sort of association or identification, brute identification, would be the case of adultery. If adultery is committed, it does not automatically mean that the new partner somehow becomes legally married and attached to um, the uh, the person uh, committing the adultery. So it's uh, if a man is, is, has committed adultery, he doesn't have two wives as soon as he's committed adultery. Um, you know, he may have financial responsibility if a child results from his marital infidelity or adultery, but that's not the same thing as an identification of sex and marriage. Um, as a matter of fact, the sex act is something that should be repented of and um, not something that would entail um, a marriage commitment. Is anyone going to argue the position that God is for us having three ways or four ways because of marital infidelities that were committed? Obviously not. Marriage is currently the safest place for women and children. This has been found in study after study. It is ironic because the researchers often admit to a negative bias against the health of marriage. They often combined data regarding cohabiting couples with data on married couples to try to show that heterosexual relationships were violent. But in fact, there is a far greater violence demonstrated in cohabitation environments than in married households. Living together is a dangerous prospect for both women, girlfriends, and her children, male and female. Marriage reduces rather than fosters violence in interpersonal relationships. It's hard to find a safer pursuit than to enter into marriage with a spouse. 
Marriage also endows men with better health, greater longevity, more wealth, and more enjoyment of sex. Contrary to popular thought, married couples have as much or more sex than live-in couples. Married men actually enjoy sex physically more than live-in male partners. It benefits women's health, wealth, and frequency of sex as well as providing a safety net. Children have been found to do best living with married parents even when researchers constantly tried to find otherwise. Why does all this matter? It matters because marriage provides lasting benefits not just to Christian couples who marry in the church, but to society as a whole. The whole world stands to benefit from marriage. So it is worth promoting it. Also, removing it from the law system, as MCL suggests, might lead to untoward complications. One of these complications might be polygamy or multiple partner relationships, where patriarchalist values thrive and women are given little or no voice. Does that seem a little extreme? Perhaps, but in 2006, a group of liberal professors and legal researchers teamed up to contemplate what the future of marriage might look like after homosexual marriage had become the norm. The results of their inquiry yielded some scary prospects. Their work, entitled Beyond Marriage Project, noted that future relationship models could very well include, unquote, households in which there are more than one conjugal partner. That's just another way of saying that this society would be pro-polygamy. Yet the liberal scholars envisioning this future are not dismayed. They're actually jumping on board and welcoming the future of marriage. One of the project's supporters is Chaya Feldblum, a Georgetown legal theorist who serves as head of Obama's Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Welcoming this sort of future is inviting sexism, misogyny, and patriarchy. Do we want a society where people do whatever is right in their own eyes, a situation that we saw after the flood? This is not a good situation. It leaves the door wide open for polygamy, which all women should be concerned about. In all the places in the world where polygamy is practiced, women are not treated very well. Many would argue that this is because of cultural influences that we don't have. But as we have seen, culture can change very quickly. How many female doctors were there 40 years ago? Would we even have been discussing gay marriage 40 years ago? We don't want women to lose their hard-won rights. For these reasons, we believe that marriage should be coded and protected in the law. Whether or not there should be benefits which accrue to marriage partners is a completely different issue. Um, that could be raised um, in another context. Um, we could have church-sanctioned uh, marriage without any state-provided uh, benefits or tax benefits or anything like that. Um, but that's kind of a different discussion as to whether marriage is healthful, edifying, and salubrious for the whole of society and for the members of the church, um, and whether the dissolution of that estate, of that institution, um, would cause decline, social, economic, and moral decline in society. So really, we need to tackle that issue, and we can we could probably debate later what specific benefits. Um, so how then do we continue to protect the definition, the traditional definition of marriage between one man and one woman? Well, we see three clear strategies. First, since marriage was invented by God and is administered through the church, the church is the only body that has the right to define marriage. And really, even that is pretty limited itself because the church is, um, uses the Bible as a handbook, so the church can't just rewrite the definition as it pleases them or as society may call or demand for such. The government um, has a different role than the church. I think mere Christian logic would agree with that. Um, the government can recognize or honor the uh, place and the value which the church assigns to marriage, but it doesn't have the right to define it. That's not, that's not the state's job, and it really never has. If there's a religious dispute, the state may be called in, but otherwise no. So one person who has attempted to counteract any um, further deviation from um, healthy marriage in a healthy society is uh, Jonathan Last and he writes in the Weekly Standard 
um, that if the liberals goal isn't to keep pushing the boundaries of marriage and to coerce religious institutions into agreement then why not push for a federal gay marriage amendment with three principles that marriage is between two and only two human individuals that so these individuals can be of any sex and three religious groups retain a conscience conscience exemption and the recognition of any form of marriage so effectively ruling out both polygamy bestiality any other um, perversions which might be introduced um, to marriage besides um, two human uh, partners so our solution is actually very simple marriage is rightly defined by the church and it is recognized by the state this is a separation of church and state issue and secular people as well as Christians should try to retain the separation of church and state as it applies to the church as well as to the state. However, if a compromise is necessary, then it is incumbent upon liberals to provide a solution for our concerns. And they can do this very easily by adding an amendment that shows that they're not trying to censor us, they're not trying to tell us what to do in our churches, they're not trying to take over and devalue marriage, but rather that they're just trying to extend a civil right. And since that's what they said they've been trying to do, that should be fairly easy. Wouldn't that be a reasonable proposal?